Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn de Weir and this is Spies and Jailbreaks, Women and Medieval Warfare. The first podcast of 2018 was initially due to be released in a few weeks' time with the return to the Great Famine series. While that's still very much on track and going ahead, I found getting back into writing on January the 2nd a little difficult. Famine episodes are pretty complex and my brain was perhaps a little slow after Christmas. So I've decided that I'm going to get back into the swing of things by publishing an extra episode on a topic that I have already prepared the notes for. The title of today's show pretty much explains what's coming in the podcast. It's all about how women participated in medieval warfare. Now if you're a fan of Game of Thrones, you're going to love this show. It's an often overlooked aspect of our history, how women participated in warfare in the Middle Ages. While we often think of chivalrous knights protecting helpless maidens, this is far from reality of late medieval life as we are about to see. Now before we tuck in, I would like to thank all the patrons who have supported the show so far. It's your support that keeps this podcast coming out as frequently as it does. If you want to become a patron of the Irish History Podcast and get lots of exclusive content available only to patrons, check out patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Irish podcast. As I say, there's lots of bonus material there, including extra podcasts and you also get early access to the show. The Middle Ages is often the backdrop to fantasy fiction, but the reality of day-to-day life in medieval Ireland by around the year 1300 was beyond what most of us could conjure up in our worst nightmares. After the upheaval of the Norman invasion of the 1170s, life had stabilised for several decades. By the year 1200, the Normans seemed utterly dominant and the vanquished Gaelic-Irish natives, by and large, appeared to be accepting their second-class status in the new Kingdom of Ireland, which was ruled by the Kings of England. However, from about the year 1270, the island began on what proved to be a slow descent into violence and barbarism. It had first begun with isolated revolts among the Gaelic-Irish who, having been pushed into the mountainous regions unwanted by the Normans, were forced to steal food in times of famine. These revolts were brutally suppressed by the Anglo-Normans. However, as the 13th century drew to a close, the situation was growing ever more serious. 1295 had seen another Gaelic revolt in in the midst of a serious famine and through the opening years of the new century attacks and revolts on Norman farms continued. These attacks were frequently small scale. For example, in December 1311, William and Tai Gotuhi were convicted of killing the Norman Geoffrey Lelang in a raid where they took 16 cows and 40 sheep. However, on occasion, the attacks could be far greater in scope and scale. For example, in 1308, several towns, including Athai, were attacked during a major revolt which spread across the Wicklow and Schlieve Bloom mountains. While there was undoubtedly a sense that life was becoming difficult, it was the year 1315 that proved the decisive moment when the situation spiralled beyond all control. A Scots army invaded Ulster and the Anglo-Normans were defeated in several major battles in that fatal summer of 1315. Then the Gaelic-Irish across the island knew this was their moment and took advantage attacking Norman farms. In order to understand what this world was like I want to read a short excerpt from an account from a Norman called Hugh Lawless. He was one of the most prominent Norman landowners in the mountainous region of Wicklow and in 1315 he detailed the bleak reality he and his family were facing. Hugh Lawless described how the Irish of the Leinster Mountains, manifestly unable to restrain themselves, put themselves at war against the Lord King, just as the other Irish in this land did, and they hostilely invaded, burned and totally destroyed the aforesaid lands and tenements of the Lord King and all other lands of diverse lieges of the King. Lawless's description went on to paint a vivid but frightening picture of life in Wicklow, 
where the once dominant Norman settlers were now living in what was a siege-like situation. The ancient and famous monastery at Glendalough in the mountains had long become inaccessible to Normans, while the once prosperous settlement of Castle Kevin, deep in the mountains, had also been abandoned. Its garrison had been slaughtered back in 1308. Hugh Lawless admitted that he and his fellow settlers in Wicklow were We're living living in a confined confined and narrow part part of the country country, where they had the sea between Wales and Ireland for a wall on one side and the mountains of Leinster and diverse other wooded and deserted places on the other where the said Irish felons live. Now for those of you who don't know it, the place that he's talking about here is the region in Wicklow between the towns of Newcastle and Bray. Life there was very difficult. The distance between the sea and the mountains he's talking about is no more than 15 kilometres. One can imagine that on a nightly basis, the Normans in their increasingly vulnerable settlements would have been looking west towards the mountains, seeing yet another farm burning and refugees from isolated farmsteads streaming towards the coast. Even though they were clearly struggling to survive, the Norman authorities in Dublin were in no position to send a major expedition south to help Lawless and the Normans in Wicklow. They were facing multiple pleas all across the island which were equally important. Not even Dublin itself was secure by this point. Each night crossbowmen had to take up watch in the Exchequer building located only about a 100 metres from the medieval city walls. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is this is clearly a society that was falling apart and life wasn't going to improve. If anything, it was only going to get worse. Warfare was becoming increasingly common and some of the battles which took place, such as the Battle of Athenry in 1316, were truly massive by contemporary standards. Now traditional history tends to focus on the role of men in this period. Individuals like Hugh Lawless are remembered not only because they fought in these battles, but also because it's their words that tend to survive. This has left us with a somewhat fairy tale stereotype of knightly men protecting damsels in distress. While there is little doubt the battles between armies were, by and large, the preserve of men, focusing on these large scale encounters creates a distorted picture of warfare in medieval Ireland and, most importantly, the role of women in it. As we're about to see, medieval women were by no means helpless and did not need chivalrous knights to protect them. While they've played a far more prominent role than we might imagine, historical records are littered with the hardships that women faced in the Middle Ages on a day-to-day basis. While they were far more involved in warfare than we are led to believe, Their lives were very, very difficult and far more difficult than those of men. Many women were mistreated. For example, in the 1270s, the Earl of Ulster, Walter de Burgh, married his cousin, Eleanor de Nangle, to A. O'Neill, the king of the O'Neill family, in the hope that this would secure good relations with the powerful Gaelic Irish O'Neills. Ultimately, Eleanor de Nangle would have had little choice in this, which took her far from her family and friends. Against the odds, other women did achieve remarkable feats. In the early 13th century, Roesia de Verdun ruled the Lordship of Louth along with her vast estates in England after refusing to remarry following the premature death of her second husband. She even successfully outmaneuvered one of the most dangerous and powerful men of the age, Hugh de Lacy the Younger, the then Earl of Ulster. Nevertheless, aristocratic women like Roesia were not able to directly engage in warfare and they were often abused and mistreated by their families, as we saw with Eleanor de Nangle. For this podcast, though, I'm going to be looking further down the social ladder from the lives of women who came from more ordinary backgrounds. Luckily, we have a clear enough picture of their lives from around the year 1300, as life in Ireland was spiralling out of control. And from this picture, it's very clear that women were playing a very active role in warfare. The conflict between the Gaelic Irish natives and the Norman settlers that was becoming more frequent was by no means standard warfare in the Middle Ages. It frequently did not take the shape of two armies facing each other across a battlefield. Frontiers between the two sides were not always clear, with Gaelic Irish rebels living in what was ostensibly Norman-controlled areas. Conflict could take the form of raids and killings, as well as the occasional large-scale attack. And accounts from the time are full of women actively involved. 
In some cases, it was logistical support. For example, in 1311, a woman called Balak or Tuhi was convicted of sheltering her brothers after they had murdered a Norman and carried out a major robbery. Other women were more directly involved. In the same case, two other Gaelic Irish women, Fenina and Isabella O'Tuhi, Balloch's mother and sister, were hauled before the same court. These two women were charged with having what was called art and part in the robberies and murder. Both of these two women were shown no leniency and sentenced to death. Fenina, the mother, was to be hanged immediately, while Isabella secured a stay of execution. As she was pregnant by her husband, Thomas de Val, she was not hanged, but instead recommitted to jail, where she was to give birth to her child. It was only at that point that she was to face the noose. In the early 14th century, knowledge of colonial territory was very crucial for Gaelic Irish raids and many women operated as spies passing information to Gaelic Irish forces when they were planning robberies or raids. One woman who lived along the frontier between Gaelic Irish regions and the Anglo-Norman territories was a certain Grace O'Toole. Although married to a colonist, Andrew Devaney, she was a member of the O'Toole family who were frequently at war with the Normans. Now such mixed marriages were not unusual at all. Indeed, as communities lived side by side, they were somewhat inevitable. However, after her marriage, it appears that Grace moved to and lived in Norman territories. But she also remained in contact with her rebel family who lived in the mountains. This unique position saw her frequently act as a go-between between between the colonists on the one hand and the Gaelic Irish on the other. She was said to, and I quote, to go to parts of the mountains to see and search for cattle carried off by her race. Grace, however, was also living in a time where this volatile region surrounding the Wicklow Mountains was on the verge of exploding into a full-scale war. In 1308, the Anglo-Norman settlement at Castle Kevin had been burned and the entire garrison put to the sword. In response, a certain Walter O'Toole, perhaps a relation of Grace's, was captured, taken to Dublin, tied to a horse and dragged through the city streets and then, finally, brought to the city gallows where he was hanged. Nevertheless, Grace appears to have stayed in contact with her family across the frontier, even as it became more and more violent. But her role as a mediator changed. In 1318, Grace was hauled before the courts herself. This time, she was accused of spying, and as a result of her activities, the court claimed, and I quote, The men of Sagart were robbed by the Irish of the mountains of diverse goods. Whether she had been guilty of spying all along or perhaps her attitude to the Norman colonists had changed, we will never know. But Grace O'Toole received no mercy as she was hanged. While it's understandable that many Gaelic Irish women were involved in such activity, there are some more unusual cases where Anglo-Norman women spied for Gaelic Irish rebels. But before we look at that, I want to take a quick break. If you're enjoying this history, you'll love my audio book, 1348, The Medieval Apocalypse, The Black Death in Ireland. This looks at the history of four men and four women who lived through the early 14th century in what was one of the most trying but fascinating times in Ireland's past. It details the intriguing story of revolts among the poor as aristocratic families battle for control of the island. That is, of course, until 1348, when the Black Death strikes and everything is changed forever. Now, you can find this audiobook at my website, irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. The book in total is about five hours long and is narrated by myself. While the normal price is 9 99 you can get it for the next 30 days for just five euros. So why not go now to irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop and get that audiobook today with 50% off. Now let's get back to the show. While Wicklow was one of the most volatile regions in Ireland during this period, it was matched by an increasingly complex and bitter struggle that was engulfing the Midlands around the Schlieve Bloom Mountains. Here the nature of the conflict was Byzantine. While the Anglo-Normans and the Gaelic-Irish were increasingly at war with each other, the Anglo-Normans often battled each other using Gaelic-Irish families as allies as well. For example, in 1295, the Lord of Offaly, John Fitzthomas, had worked with the Gaelic-Irish Odemses to attack the Anglo-Norman town of Kildare. 
Warfare in this region was particularly violent and bitter though, perhaps even more so than it had been in Wicklow. In 1305, for example, Peter de Birmingham committed what was probably the worst atrocity of the age when he invited the Gaelic Irish O'Connor Folly family to a feast in his castle of Tetmoy. Even though his own godson was among the guests, de Birmingham slaughtered over 20 members of the O'Connor family in his own home. His godson, Mazer O'Connor, was thrown from the battlements. In this massacre, de Birmingham's own wife played a part. The Gaelic-Irish Annals of Inish Fallon recalled how she used to give warning from the top of the castle of any who went into hiding so that many were slain as a result of, of those warnings. However, it was inevitable other Anglo-Norman women played a more direct and dangerous role. Isabella Cadle was one such woman. Born the daughter of William Cadle, an influential Norman in the Midlands and close ally of the Lord of Offaly, she hailed from what was a very prominent Norman lineage. Isabella herself was married to the Gaelic Irishman Dermot O'Dempsey, a long-standing ally of the Normans in the Midlands, and her marriage was presumably an attempt to cement the alliance. Unfortunately for Isabella, political relations in the Midlands became increasingly strained in the early 14th century, and as the region destabilised and tensions heightened, Isabella found her own family and her husband on opposite sides of the developing conflict. In 1302, she and a servant, Finewell, found themselves journeying into the Gaelic Irish territory of the Schlieve Bloom Mountains to meet Irish rebels. While she completed the arduous trip, she and her servant, Finewell, were arrested for, and I quote, having art and part with felons and our spies of the country for them. It seems that the Anglo-Norman authorities were increasingly suspicious of her husband, Dermot O'Dempsey, and his family's activities, and suspected Isabella was passing them information. Being accused of aiding the Gaelic Irish in the Schlieve Blue Mountains at this point was a very serious charge though. For example, in 1297, a man called Nicholas Tone had been hanged for the exact same offence. Isabella Cadel was tried and she did admit to bring gifts to the Gaelic Irish rebels in the Schlieve Blue Mountains. Found guilty, her assets were declared forfeit, but she was pardoned and avoided the death penalty. The reasons for the lax sentence in this specific case was due to what the judge called the simplicity of women in this affair and the praiseworthy service of Isabella's father. Ultimately, the relations between Isabella's Gaelic-Irish in-laws and the Crown reached a breaking point and in 1308 Anglo-Norman forces killed her husband, Dermot O'Dempsey. The final case in today's podcast brings us back to Dublin and is one of the most daring missions I've ever come across from the period. Fingal MacTurkle was born in the later 13th century and married into the prestigious MacTurkle family. They had once been Norse rulers of Dublin before the Normans had captured the city in 1170. By the 1310s though, their star had fallen. Given they appeared to have been living close to the Wicklow Mountains, it seems inevitable that the MacTurkles had become embroiled in the growing warfare between the Gaelic Irish and the Anglo-Normans in the region. And certainly by 1313, Walter MacTurkle, Fingal's husband, had fallen foul of the Norman authorities. He had taken up with three Gaelic Irishmen and they were said to be common robbers and notorious felons. In July of 1313, this group, including Walter MacTurkle, were captured and brought to Dublin Castle. They were held awaiting trial in the imposing fortress that formed the southeastern corner of the medieval city. Imprisoned in dark cells, their prospects were poor. If convicted, their impending fate was the hangman's noose, or worse. Helpless, all they could do was await their doom. However, outside the castle walls, a woman called Fingal MacTurkle, Walter's wife, was planning a daring jailbreak. As her husband and the others awaited trial, Fingal made her way to the castle under the cover of darkness. How exactly she did this is not clear, but she managed to gain entry with sheets which were then to be used by the prisoners to fashion ropes by which they could then climb down Dublin Castle's walls. Unfortunately, the plan was perhaps too audacious and all involved, including Fingal, were caught. Dragged before the courts, this was never going to end well. The four members of the group, including Fingal's husband, Walter, now had a charge of sedition added to their crimes. All were found guilty and sentenced to hang, but two of the four, including Fingal's husband, 
were suspected of other crimes and they received a particularly nasty punishment. They were humiliated by being drawn behind the tails of horses through the streets of Dublin, after which they were hanged. Fingal herself was also in very serious trouble. Not only was she accused of having attempted to break her husband and the other gang members from Dublin Castle, but she had, according to the court, participated not only in the misdeeds of her husband, but also the other felons. Fingal McTurkle was hauled before the court, but, although facing the highest official in Ireland, she was by no means intimidated. Standing before Edmund Butler, the justiciar, she pretended to be mute and refused to speak. In the Middle Ages, it was not allowed to move a case forward against someone who was unable to speak, so Fingal herself was returned to prison. Now, although the record isn't entirely clear, it does seem that she did eventually manage to secure her release, a fate far better than being executed, no matter how long she had to spend in prison. This podcast has only touched on a small fraction of the story of how women were involved in medieval warfare, and it's certainly far more than we might expect or that history usually portrays. While I will be returning to the story of the Great Famine in the next podcast, if you are interested in this type of history, I do have over 20 episodes in the back catalogue on the Norman invasion of Ireland, which are well worth checking out. As I say, in two weeks I'll be back with the Great Famine series, and in that show I'll be focusing on the story of evictions. If you want to get that episode early, you can sign up on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast where you can get lots of exclusive content as well. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>